some of my world into your world, expose you to some of my personal struggles and frustrations, but also hopes and dreams and achievements. Um, it is a personal journey uh, in a very convoluted world full of struggles and questions, and uh, sometimes we don't have the answers, which is okay. I don't think we all uh, have figured out things yet. The story started off by me being a very young, protective, spoiled girl in uh, a country where family ties are stronger than ever. Uh, my mom and, and father both come from a province called Qasim, uh, which is north of Riyadh, the capital, uh, known for two things, uh, dates, producing the best dates in the world, but also being a very conservative place. Um, my father was born to a family of farmers. Uh, he literally was born in a farm with his uh, cord being cut off by his mom in the field. Uh, my mother comes from what of a, somewhat of a different background. Her, her father was a merchant. They used to travel quite a lot. She got exposed to a variety of different uh, experiences in her life. Um, brought up in Saudi Arabia, uh, traveled the world a bit uh, until the year 2000 when my father came into our living room announcing that we are going on a lifetime journey to the US. On a plane we go, uh, arriving at the Big Apple doing the tour, down at Disneyland doing the five parks and you know, that is an achievement of itself for a kid at that time. Off to California, and then of course we had to do Las Vegas. <laughs> Vegas, first night, uh, sitting around a dinner table, uh, five of us, I'm the eldest of five, my mother and father, enjoying dinner, cracking up jokes, um, and, and really planning our next leg of the trip, which would be Alaska. My father started aching and we thought he was just exhausted from all the travels that we were doing. So off he went to his room uh, to get some rest. We had followed uh, a few minutes later to find him down on his knees by the bed, screaming his lungs out. A scene that I have never seen before. Um, in my mind, he's this powerful, mighty man. Uh, to find him on his knees was kind of strange. My mom calls up the general practitioner at the hotel. He comes up to the room. He looks at him and he says, I'm afraid this is serious. You'll have to call 911. 911 come in. They look at him and you know, off he goes in an ambulance to Sunrise Hospital in Vegas. In a van, my mom shoves the five of us and drives along and we go to the emergency room and wait for five hours, the longest five hours of my lifetime. The doctors come back and you know, call up for my mom and say, Mrs. Alizaz, how old is your husband? 40 years old of age at that point in time. Any medical conditions, any, any history? Not at all. A smoker? No. An addict? Not at all. Uh, any medical history in the family? Absolutely not. Parents are alive and kicking and very active. Well, I'm sorry to say your husband has been diagnosed with a fourth stage brain tumor. We need to operate on him right away. They take him to the operation room while we wait, and we're still reflecting on that news, kind of news that you get when you know a bomb is thrown in the backyard where children are or playing crashes while we were sipping coffee. It's that kind of news that you never contemplated or saw coming. It's the kind of news that you can't deal with and you haven't been prepped for. 
Off he went to the operation room while we wait for results. He comes out. Going in as a young, healthy, handsome man, coming out with his head half shaved uh, and a scar that goes right through, losing his ability to walk and talk and having to learn it all over again like a child. His memory has been taken away. He couldn't recognize all of us right away, and he had to work out on certain things to help him come back to life. As he puts it, he was knocking on heaven's door and given a chance to come back to life and revisit some of the things that he was doing. It's funny how things end up, but he describes it as the best period of time because it was a low period where he had most time to spend with the family as opposed to being so busy and working and traveling and doing all the kind of things that we all are busy doing. It's very ironic because it is at a time when we were away in Saudi Arabia. He was in Vegas, and then he moved to Houston and got treated at MD Anderson, um, one of the best hospitals out there. Um, it is at a time when I, as a 14-year-old, was going through you know, teenage years of my life, struggling with you know, love and relationships, school and homework, and parents not being there. 18 months into it, and he eventually lost that battle to cancer. Um, unfortunately, what that meant for someone like me is all that protective environment has gone away, and I'm now naked in front of the world. That level of protection is gone, not only from an emotional point of view, but also from a legal system that requires a man to be part of your life. Uh, we live in a nation where a man is a source of consent for pretty much everything you do. Women are treated as perpetual minors uh, in many ways. So he is the source of consent for travel, for marriage, uh, for education, her job and all of that, to be exposed to that source being taken away and be faced with a question of what's next? You know, do, do you pause and is life now on edge? Do you escape and go somewhere else? That's a question that I get faced with all the time. Instead, what I chose to do is, um, well, there's little choice there, but fight that fight and pick up that battle. And it's that desire and life and dignity and hope and dreams that kept me going. I was called into court as a 16-year-old, uh, shuffling between classrooms and homework and exams and attending court sessions, um, something that I struggled with. I didn't have the uh, toolkit that one would need, but it was common sense. Uh, it was a matter of going and reciting parts of the holy book that really, in my mind, backed up my case. I was an orphan, and you know, you don't mess up with orphans. <laughs> you just don't. Unfortunately, again, the fact that I was a female uh, in that courtroom did not help. And it did push me out of the door. I got questioned a lot of the times where, you know, things like, where is your guardian? Where is your male companion? And in fact, the question in my mind, I wouldn't be where I am arguing this case if I had someone besides me. My brother at that time was six years old, so he wasn't of age to be able to help out. The question then becomes a struggle of power. Who is next in line? Is it your grandfather? Is it your uncle? Uh, is, it, is it your husband? I wasn't married. I was never married. Um, and so all of these questions that I've never faced have more, all came to my mind that I had to resolve them. Unfortunately, it's a struggle, but never a surrender. Uh, we never really got to the bottom of things. Uh, luckily, my dad had left the will on a piece of paper with the letterhead of the hospital. And that was my uh, secret ingredient that helped me pave the way. I argued the case and was able to enforce that and, and, and protect it uh, for the longest time. It gave me a solution, an interim solution to maneuver life uh, as, as, as much as I could. 
important part, though, was my mom, who was behind us fighting a different battle, which is a battle for education, a battle for us to have a sense of belonging, a battle for us to have a meaning for life, regardless of that irrational debate that goes on in a court or in a society. And she certainly was the force behind me going abroad and pursuing the law degree at a time when law faculties did not open their doors for females. So off to England I went and faced with another challenge. I thought my English was all right until I went to a town northeast of English of England, and their English was pretty different. I couldn't figure things out. I also was faced with the reality of being a student in a school in Saudi Arabia where we really pretty much stuck to the textbook. You know, free thinking was not something that is encouraged. Uh, critical analysis was something that I didn't really understand. It's a matter of just memorizing what the textbook says and reciting it to someone. So we were reporters more than students most of the time. I was faced with the reality of walking into a lecture room with hundreds of other students, brilliant students from around the world, coming in with very little tools other than my poor English, and being faced with the reality of having to dig through cases and reports and articles. And my mind wasn't really functional at that point in time. I wasn't really set up to be thinking that way. Um, so while people were able to, you know, go 3,000 miles an hour, I was stuck with my digi digital dictionary figuring, you know, some terminology and trying to recap on what the professor just said. It was a struggle, again. And it was a slap in the face when I worked so hard and got my first big fat F when I submitted my first F called up my mom at that point in time, and I thought, you know what, this is it. I tried, and the beauty was in the attempt. I think I should pack up my things and come back home. She did say, you know what, just go along with the flow, and let's see what happens. It was more of a concentration camp to me than a university. I used to go into the shower every 10 minutes to keep myself awake because I couldn't afford you know, sleeping in or spending time watching a film or a movie or reading a book. Every minute counted. Four years later, thankfully, I graduated with that law degree that I was pursuing very eagerly and desperately and knew that was the only thing that will back me up in this world. I came back to Saudi to be yet yeah, faced with another struggle. Well, yeah, what do you do with this law degree in a system that doesn't recognize you as a lawyer because of your gender? And at a time when the Ministry of Justice did not allow a woman to practice law, I thought, well, I'm crippled yet again. New York presented itself very well. They told me that there was something called the bar exam. In my mind, the bar is where you go and have some drinks, which I couldn't do. Um, so off I went on a plane again uh, and went to New York and crammed for months and months. In my mind, the odds are I pretty, fail, pretty much failed that exam, which again does not you know, help. Um, I remember the day we got the results. Were, it was the same day when the royal marriage of Kate and William was going on. And I, was, I decided to sleep in that day, and my mom comes knocking on the door saying, you better wake up. And I said, well, I really don't care about the royal wedding. She goes, no, 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 this is not about the royal wedding. She walks into my room, throws a newspaper on my bed, and I looked it up, and it had a headline that said, Shahana Lazar is breaking through and taking the Saudi woman into a new world. And I'm like, really? What does that mean? Uh, it did mean that they, they found out that I passed the bar exam before I did. <laughs> so uh, that was, again, a relief. There we go. Another tool in your little kit that will help you maneuver. Well, what is next? You've got the law degree, you've got some admission and recognition elsewhere. Um, the question then in my mind is, do you pack up and leave yet again and explore an opportunity elsewhere, or do you go back home? Home was the answer. That sense of belonging was the answer. 
despite the struggle, despite the frustration, despite those roadblocks on the way, we tend to go back home. Migration, in my mind, was meant for birds, not human beings. And so off I went to Saudi Arabia yet again and faced with the reality of job opportunities not presenting themselves very well. And I've kind of set myself up for failure. I pursued a degree that wasn't really allowed for females, pursued a profession that was prohibited for females. So if anywhere, anyone was to blame, it was me. Luckily enough, uh, one of the law firms that was in Saudi Arabia at the time offered me a job. I practiced behind closed doors for four years uh, until we pushed boundaries gently, elegantly, never with anger or violence. And that petition went off to our king, and slowly change came about. And women were allowed to practice law after such a long time. Another accomplishment, one at a time, but never really yet there. Uh, there was always that glass ceiling, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So what is the path, and how do we pave the path for oneself? The most important, I think, aspect of it is not to be alone in that journey. So I quickly turned around and thought to myself, what if I help other women get into that field? There will be too much of us that can't turned around and created those internships for girls who were graduating from local universities at that time. And it proved to be a very successful um, program. I was accused of being biased, and that's okay. I think it's called affirmative action in the US. But frankly speaking, and I did test this, if I were to censor the names off those resumes that I received, and let anyone pick the candidate that they thought would be best. It was the female. And maybe the reason was they went through a different journey, a journey that was full of struggle and frustration and shaped them into what they are. Um, so we quickly built up a team, both men and women, and worked together. I reached a comfort zone at that point in time with Baker McKenzie, who thought of set myself up for partnership. But that comfort zone was scary because I felt like I'm not going forward anymore. Vincent and Elkins was presenting a unique opportunity. They'd never opened an office in Saudi Arabia before, and they presented that opportunity of being part of the first layer, part of that brick in the foundation. Come and mark your you know, self as, as the leader and pioneer in, in our office. There were other law firms that pre present equally good opportunities, but they were the same law firms that shut the doors five and four years before that when I was a nobody. And now when I'm making headlines, you want to capitalize on that? Hell no, I would not. <laughs> um, so I turned down those offers and um, in a very counterintuitive way, went off and pursued a new opportunity uh, with a law firm that didn't really exist at that time and we helped put together and build. Five years into it, uh, we were a full-fledged law firm in Saudi Arabia, focused on oil and gas and energy because that was the niche practice that Beanie brought into the market, but did a range of things from M&A and capital markets and litigation and arbitration and whatnot. Again, a comfort zone after five years of building teams and putting people together. Um, and then the government called me up. Oh boy, what to do now? I mean, now was this sort of free thinker, thinker floating around in private practice doing my own thing. To switch to government was very different and difficult. But we are going through interesting times in Saudi Arabia, and change has never come about the way it is now. We've got a new young leadership. Um, our crown prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is a visionary guy. And he is a person that a lot of our generation, my generation, can relate to. For the longest time, we had older, wise men ruling our country. For the very first time, we had someone of our generation. Mind you, this is a country that is very young. The majority of the people are under the age of 30. 
So the opportunities, but the challenges that we present as a young nation had someone to understand them, and His Royal Highness was one. He did announce about a year and a half ago a very ambitious program called the National Transformation Program. And the essence of that program is the following. Obviously, with the turmoil going around, you know, all our the borders are surrounded by wars and uprisings and failed states and all of that. Oil prices dropping to, you know, prices that they have dropped to. Being an economy that is so dependent on oil, all of these struggles presented themselves at the same time. So he announced this ambitious program uh, to reform our economy. It was both an economic and social program. Some of the main pillars is to bring women into the workforce. There have been attempts before that. One of the key things that happened a few years back was feminizing retail. And I say feminizing, it literally meant that. We had a situation where all retail stores, whether cosmetics, lingerie, clothes, whatever, uh, were served by men only. So I'd walk it as ironic as it sounds, I'd walk into a store, you know, probably covered in my black robe and hijab, and start discussing, you know, my makeup with a man, or, you know, the size of my underwear with a man. So it, it was very controversial and, and, and stupid. So that change came about, and it created job opportunities for thousands and thousands of girls. Another change came about very recently, which is um, the introduction of sports for females. For the longest time, sports and physical education was not taught to girls in schools. Uh, there was no opportunity to exercise in a gym for a female. We exercise in person and in private because female gyms did not exist. Uh, there were, I think for the first time, four female participants in the last Olympic Games from Saudi Arabia. So again, a whole new field for females to embark on and, and explore. The legal field, as I just explained, was open a floodgate of lawyers coming in and, and working the, their way out. It was an interesting time, so I had two options. When that opportunity with the government presented itself, I could e either walk the path that I've already started and continue to be in private practice. Or be part of that system for 12 years before that, you know, frustrated me so much and caused me so many issues. Why not be that lady in government that introduces change? It's not to say that it doesn't come without challenges. But wherever you go, there will be that one annoying person. But once you meet them, just greet them and be happy that you found them and just embrace it. It is a struggle, it is a change, but I think the one key message I want you all to take away from today is to look beyond our stereotypical preconceived notions of what a Saudi woman is like and what you know, a woman in Salt Lake City is like. We all share struggles. I hear the equal pay issue in the US comes along in every debate or discussion I have. Pretty much doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia, can you not? The equal opportunity issue does come up and is there, but the equal pay issue is not there, interesting. So I think the basic idea is to really look beyond what people look like or how they dress up or what the media tells you. I think we are living in very interesting times where virtual reality has overtaken our actual reality. And what we hear in the media is really feeding into our fears and how we think our nations should be run. And that is a very dangerous proposition and a very dangerous world to be in. It is a very small world. What happens in the Middle East will affect people in the US. What happens in Latin America will affect people in Asia and whatnot. We've never lived in such a small world, a connected world, as we live in today. And I do think that it comes down to people. It's those relationships that we build between each other. It's those bridges that we build among each other. It's 
It's that Jewish friend that I've met four years ago that I traveled to with in so many different places. It's that, you know, Christian friend that comes and hosts me every time I come to New York. It, it, it's looking beyond our faith and religion. It com it's coming together because of our dreams and aspirations. And I truly, truly believe that it starts with two people coming together and bonding and creating those friendships that will live beyond our fears and beyond what our governments think and beyond what our voters think. So please, with today's you know evening, please, please, please do think broadly and look beyond those preconceived notions. With that, I really urge you to ask as many questions as you want and, and keep those difficult questions coming up. There is no question that can't be asked. Thank you very much. So we have several mics that we can uh, spread throughout the room. In fact, if we could have those helpers come up and grab them up here. And I ask you to use the mic not so she can hear you, but everyone can hear your questions. First of all, we are all so proud of you and all the progress you've made. Thank you so So my question is, is I want to know what is the reaction from Saudi women. Do you get any feedback, negative feedback here? Very good question. There was a period of time when obviously you attract and solicit unwanted attention and commentary because you are faking through taboos and you know walking a path that is not, not conventional. I think you win them over eventually and when I say that I reflect on my own modest journey when I first went off abroad to study, everyone was against it. I mean, apart from my mother and siblings and maybe a couple of the extended family, everyone was like, really? Are you sending her off on her own? What's going to happen to her? Is she going to wander off with a guy? Like, all these kind of questions come up. Funny enough, as soon as you start, you know, passing with colorful, you know, marks, they come and say, oh, we want the same for our daughters. Um, and it's, it's just a matter of proving the case that this is a path of dignity and hope uh, and dreams. And it is proving the case. And unfortunately, you have to go through a moment in time or a period in time where you will be attacked, uh, you will be criticized, I still do. Uh, but do you get into a debate, an irrational, everlasting debate, or do you focus on the things that really matter? And do you bring about change that is positive and that really impacts people's lives? I would say focus on the latter. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing. Um, I have a question that you mentioned, um, especially when we first started out in school in England and you were failing and struggling and you called your mom and you're like, that's it, I'm coming home. And she said no, and you stuck it through, and obviously it was successful. What was it that really made you um, overcome those challenges and all the future challenges? And then, what do you say um, now? I'm sure you have commended mentees and other women coming to you as they're going through challenges where it's so hard to push forward and it's so easy to just walk away. What do you tell them? A few things. Um, I think um, I've learned it the hard way. Um, the, the, the story I've shared and the struggle that we went through, uh, seeing my father, you know, lose his ability to control his body or memory, or, it, it was something that, you know, I didn't realize until I saw before my, my own eyes. To be able to know exactly what's wrong, I look him in the eye and I know that there's a brain tumor sitting right there in your left corner but I can't do anything about it, and he can't do anything about it. And he slowly loses you know, self-control and body control, and he's so weak. Um, gives me that sense of, until you're in that position, you ought to do whatever it takes. Until you, know, you are literally not in control and unable due to 
circumstances that are out of your control, you ought to push through. You have no other excuse. The other thing I think is that you have little options. If you know, you can't look back and turn back and say, oh, my father will take care of me or my mother will hold me on. And, you know, that safety net is taken away. And all you're left with is yourself. And you either help yourself and pick up the pieces and move forward. All you, you'll always be, you know, in this desperate situation of uh, uh, failure. But the third and most important thing is faith. I won't say I am, you know, a very religious person, but I'm truly a very faithful person. I do think that there is something beyond this world that keeps us who we are, and I am very much uh, attached to that idea of, of faith. Um, and things will work out, and I go to bed every day thinking, you know, I've done all I can, I've put on all the effort, but something else will sort things out for me, and the stars will align. And I truly believe in that. And, and it worked for me tremendously. In moments of desperation, it worked the most. Uh, given your current role, uh, I was hoping you could speak a little bit on uh, Aramco's IPO, as kind of what that means for Saudi economic diversification down the road. Um, the idea really is to take our uh, oil company and float it in public markets. And that revenue will create opportunities for our economy. And this, this is something that His Royal Highness, our Crown Prince, uh, announced several times. It's a very ambitious plan. Uh, and it's, it's a, a minority stake, you know, more than 5%, uh, as far as has been announced today. Um, and it could be any market, whether in New York or London or Asia. No decision has been there. Uh, made there. Um, and the idea, again, is to take that revenue and, and reinvest it in sectors of technology, healthcare, infrastructure, real estate, you name it, and create a diversified economy for Saudi Arabia, which has been uh, for a very long time dependent on oil, something that is not sustainable, obviously, in this day and age. Um, I hope that, that answers the question. Thank you. So my question is, to what extent do you Moving forward, now that women can practice as lawyers in Saudi, how do we get them on the bench or in the judiciary? Are there similar problems? Are they the same problems that it was just for practicing law, or are there other uh, problems that are unique to specifically the judiciary that you see um, needing to be addressed, and how are people like you and similarly minded trying to address those issues? Right, and that ties into the first question. Absolutely. Let me tackle both at once. So when the change came about and the regulations that changed to allow women to practice law, we were, before that announcement uh, was, was made, we were all anxious because we thought that it, if they do allow women to practice, it will be full of restrictions and we can only do certain things and we probably would only argue family cases and only with female clients and you know, only, there was a lot of anxiety going on. Surprisingly, pleasantly, surprisingly, there were not. We were equally treated, absolutely equally treated, in terms of qualifications and requirements and what we need. Um, now, that's the, reg the, the, the set of regulations. Is it the same in practice? I would say the process of being licensed, yes, and somewhat easier. They were definitely very keen on issuing licenses in a very practical and, and, and efficient way. Um, so, you know, if I were to go and file a, uh, 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 an application for a license and a male colleague would do the same, I probably would get it faster. I probably would definitely get it faster. There was a lot of dedication and focus on getting that done. However, the, judi the judiciary is still somewhat restricted because the pipeline is a male's only pipeline. The part of the requirements to become a judge in Saudi Arabia is to be a graduate of a certain judicial institute, which unfortunately up until today does not allow women. Um, so uh, courtrooms are still restricted um, and 
you can appear before a man and argue your case before a judge, you still cannot be judge, a judge as a woman. So it is a bit restrictive uh, in, in that sense. So in closing, just two quick questions. Do you still have consent issues since you live in Saudi Arabia? I always Arabia? Don't have consent issues, for sure, but go ahead. Uh, and the last one, the piece of advice your mother gave you before you came on this trip. All right, well, the, the consent issue continues, um, but um, I must know that there has been, again, in those sort of uh, uh, the suite of uh, initiatives that have been taken by the government to pave the way and provide a better life for a Saudi uh, female. A royal decree was issued a couple months ago um, saying, something along the lines of just let her get on with her life, right? If, if the law doesn't really explicitly require consent, you're not supposed to ask for it. So there were um, practices that abuse that notion of guardianship where, for example, uh, a landlord would not lease a woman any real estate, whether an apartment, a house, a studio, you name it, without the consent of the landlord. Where did that come from? No one knows. There, there is no law that requires that. It's just practice, right? So that ought to stop. Um, certain hospitals have practices that require a man's consent to perform certain operations and procedures on a woman. Well, it's my body, for God's sake, right? And so that stops. Well, we think you're too. <laughs> But again, you know, it, it, the, the, the notion was abused, and the king decreed that that ought to stop. So that was a great improvement. In my humble opinion, it doesn't get us where we need to be. Uh, from a Sharia perspective, there are a lot of scholars out there that would argue the only consent that is absolutely required is in marriage and under a certain age. Uh, otherwise, you should be really treated as an adult. So I think there's still work to be done in that field of consent or the lack thereof. And that is the worst scenario to be put in, where you, you either don't have a man that is supportive, um, or that you have a man that is abusive. So you have a 16-year-old son who, although you're of age, 60 years old or whatever, will ask you for a paycheck every time he, you need his consent. So that has been there, and it's quite abusive in, in many ways. Piece of advice that my fighter, my mother, gave me was speak your mind, be yourself, and stand tall. And I do truly follow her advice every time. Thank you.